My name is Andrew King. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Global IT Ops. Uh, we are focused on IT outsourcing and business process uh, outsourcing and automation. Uh, really, the focus of our company is uh, towards automated uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I've worked over 20 years in IT. Uh, very first lines of code that I wrote was when I was six years old. Um, let's say IT has been my life. Working as an IT generalist has been a passion of mine. Working everything from support and help desk through to traditional webmaster back in the 90s in the dot com uh, to large enterprises, working as program manager, CIO, uh, virtual CIO for multiple Fortune 100 organizations. Uh, I have a very strong base in uh, focusing on really transformation and transition services for large corporations. Also helping small and medium sized businesses to be able to really transform into a mature model of operating. What I mean by mature operating is uh, systems that can predict and self heal. Trying to prevent outages that create a service impact. Trying to ensure that operations for a business and technical operations run 24 hours a day without failing. Prior to working and starting my own company at Global IT Ops, I worked with IPsoft. IPsoft is most recently known for Amelia and their work in artificial intelligence. Uh, Amelia is a system that is focused on natural speech and focused on uh, cognitive systems that can interact with humans, uh, that give you a human touch when you're speaking to your computer uh, they have other plans for the future that I know of as well. Very interesting product line. Um, automation in general is not something that's a new concept. The industry has been automating uh, technical operations for the last 25, 30 years. Um, artificial intelligence as it stands today is a new form of automation. It's really cognitive systems that can interact. We've gone through a revolution over the last 20 to 30 years that has required a standardization and stabilization of IT operations and business processes to be able to get to a point where we can actually replicate that into repeatable processes that automation can perform. Convergence is a point where we have everything coming together at the right moment. During the Industrial Revolution, we were faced many challenge, challenges of what is going to happen to my job. Um, now we're faced with the same challenges. People are scared. So understanding is the biggest part of this convergence, really educating the public to understand where are we going with artificial intelligence. To address this, the first thing in understanding is that we are living now in the age where artificial intelligence exists. We are living in a day and age where cognitive systems have been built, they're being tested. We have robots that are built that have natural movement. We have natural language engines that have been built on top of these robots so that they can interact with people on normal conversations. The challenge that we have really in, in the public acceptance to getting this automation into the mainstream usage is people understanding that automation is a tool that should enable us as humans. Automation is typically looked at as something as the unknown, something that's in the future, but that future is now. As we look at the research, even going back to Watson in pioneering the type of systems, as like I said, in Jeopardy, Jeopardy uh, is typically most brilliant minds would go on a game show in the United States um, and they took Watson and they put it up as a model to see if after it understood and, and it crunched the information that it was fed if it could actually think through and provide the responses to beat a human mind somebody with at, at the very highest levels of an IQ and it did it can run models on uh, computer generations and gaming through to chess So first to address the point, will I lose my job? This was the same opinion and the same speculation that people had during the Industrial Revolution. 
Ultimately, the Industrial Revolution left us in a much better place to advance as a society. We were able to create and manufacture things at a much faster rate. We have now telephones. We carry them everywhere with us. We feel it's our lifeline. People before having telephones wondered, you know, why would we have to tie ourselves to this? Now we think, how can we not live without it? Now, any time that we're faced with a major revolution in society, people, it's natural to be scared. The challenge that we're faced with now is that artificial intelligence faces a much different challenge because it's not just automating a single industry or manufacturing, for example, but it's addressing really all different types of verticals, all different types of businesses. When we look at the fears that people have, these fears can really be subsided by the fact that knowledge will let them understand where they will still have jobs. The same way as the Industrial Revolution happened and the engineering jobs were refined, the same thing will happen with artificial intelligence. We are at a point where people need to understand that they cannot be afraid of this. That if we are going to advance society and advance it light years ahead of where we've been over the last hundred years, that we need to really grasp a hold of the concepts and understand how we as humans need to adapt to harness that power. In terms of will life imitate art, people are really scared that a situation like iRobot will happen, that there will be no moral code or there will be too strict moral code so that the robots will someday understand that maybe we are too bad for ourselves. As humans, we make errors. Robots, automation, are instructed and programmed to do something the correct way or the wrong way every single time. Automation will perform the same thing as it is programmed every single time. As humans, we cannot sustain that type of repetitive motion. We get tired. We have stress in life. There are other elements in the environment around us that affect us. As we look at automation, automation can be programmed to do something right all the time, or it can be programmed to do something wrong all the time. What challenges do we face for this revolution? Um, over the last 30 years, big corporations have been focused on standardization and modernization and transformation of their environments. Big corporations have already really been preparing for it. They've been going through the trials and tests to be able to understand, you know, what is standardization, first of all? Uh, 30 years ago, computer systems were the old Wild West. People would build systems, they would do it different every single time. If you had 100 servers in an environment, you would have 95 different builds of how those servers would be implemented. So over the last 30 years, and specifically over the last 15 years, the largest corporations in the Fortune 500 have looked at how do we make it standard? How do we make repeatable processes? And they have looked at standardization, not only on the operating systems and the applications and the databases, but in the processes that surround it. Most companies went to an IDLE v3 standard. First, it started in IDLE v2, 1, and 2 that were focused on operations only. Then it went to full life cycle of how do we deal with the business? Dealing with five main points, dealing with service strategy, service design, service transition, service operations, and continual service improvement. These five areas allowed the world to start talking the same language. The same language enabled companies and outsourcing companies and innovators to be able to work together and talk the same language, even if their native language in terms of their natural speaking language was not the same. This type of progression and modernization has been an amazing feat to help advance technology and help advance business. When you talk to bank owners or executives these days, banks say, we're IT companies that do some financial transactions. And that's the reality. Because banks are actually driven by the computing systems that are their foundation. They're also driven by the processes that sit on top of it. But those processes are also driven by the computer systems that they have in their environment. So computers have really taken a core focus and foundation in our lives. So standardization as we're faced with the modernization today, the biggest challenge is the majority of the people that work in this world don't work in Fortune 1000 companies. 
So now we are faced with the majority of the people and the majority of businesses, the small to medium sized business sector, having to go through the same process that these large corporations have done over the last 15 to 30 years. So this is really the biggest challenge that we have now, is addressing that largest segment, the small to medium sized business sector. Because really for the world to benefit off of automation and artificial intelligence, you can only replicate and put artificial intelligence in place if you have a repeatable standard, if you have a modernized and process-driven standard that allows you to be able to encapsulate that for predictive results. As I mentioned earlier, automation will always do the same thing right every time or it will do the same thing wrong every time. So it is very important for the world to understand that in the small to medium-sized business sector, that they need to adapt, they need to understand, they need to train their people to understand that their jobs won't go away. Yes, they may change, and they will change, but it allows humans to actually encapsulate the smarter, more intelligent, more progressive roles of their jobs, to look at strategy, to take away the mundane daily tasks that everyone hates doing anyways. And focusing on the things that are strategic in building society and building business and building evolution. So how can companies prepare for this modernization? There are IT outsourcing companies and consulting companies that have been working with organizations, as I mentioned, for the last 15 to 30 years to try to help the big corporations prepare. Most companies feel, we're too small. You have 10 employees, you have 50 employees. What is automation gonna help us with? The reality is though you're already using automation because all of your cloud services, your email, your phone systems, those systems that you use as critical portions of your business, maybe through the cloud services, whether it be through some sort of cloud email, Office 365, these things are already running automation on the back end and already enabling your life to run better and more smoothly. So what can you do on a practical level, on the ground floor, to be able to make sure that you're preparing for it? First is knowledge. Educate yourself and educate your staff to be able to understand that these things are not bad. There's a trend in adopting automation and even outsourcing services where people think, I'm gonna lose my job so I'm gonna fight against it. When you're caught in a riptide in an ocean, the best thing to do is let your body go limp and you'll survive. It doesn't mean that we don't have to challenge, we don't need to improve, but we need to go with the flow. This is progress. Progress is defined by being able to look at improving our lives. Just as parents, we want our children to be better than us. Progress is something that is a natural instinct. We want our children to have better. So why don't we want them to have artificial intelligence? Why are there people that want to fight against it? Artificial intelligence, in fact, will improve the quality of our life. It already does. We cannot live anymore without a telephone, or a tablet, or a television. We are surrounded by automation at the highest levels of business today, without even realizing it. So first is educating ourselves to know that this is not a bad thing and also educating what we can do ourselves, small business owners, medium business owners, as individuals, to be able to accept the concept of automation and artificial intelligence. There's information from Wikipedia to videos. Every major company from social media to search engines, Google to Microsoft to IBM, they're all looking at artificial intelligence and Facebook. Who doesn't use Facebook these days? We have chatbots that learn from interaction. You ask them questions, you get the answers back, and it may not be right, but that's the thing with automation. When it makes a mistake, it never makes the same mistake two times. And this is kind of like in life, what we strive to be as individuals. What we want in our life is we're gonna make mistakes, this is human nature. But we always try to evolve and make sure that we don't make that mistake twice in life. The thing with automation is, it doesn't get tired. 
It is a relentless drive that can run the same things that a human can do in milliseconds. In IT, we have processes that are run by engineers that can take 30 to 40 minutes. Those same processes run by automation will allow in milliseconds for the same operations to be completed every single time without fail. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't need to take breaks to go to the bathroom. It doesn't need to go out and have a smoke. It just exists and it works. These are things that will enable humanity. Automation in artificial intelligence goes well beyond just technical operations. We're looking at things like automating the waitresses and waiters' positions in restaurants. There are restaurants that have been spawned all across the world where you don't need to interact. And then people ask, well, I want that personal touch. But the reality is the market will segment. You'll have a market that will still want VIP, white glove service, personal touch. And in that market, those people will actually start focusing on the strategy, on how do they perfect their services to people. They also have people, I'm from New York, in New York, businessmen want to go out, have their lunch, and go back to work. There is no time during the day to be able to pause. And those types of people will look at an automated waitress and waiter is perfect. I don't need to wait for my bill. I push the button, the bill is there. I pay with my credit card, I'm out the door. It creates a more efficient life. And in fact, it will create a better quality of life. Because just using that example in a restaurant, as you automate and use artificial intelligence to replace a waiter or waitress, in that same restaurant, you may have a back room or a side room where you have a personal touch, like you would have in a Michelin style restaurant. Imagine that walking into a McDonald's one day, and you have a room that is posh, like a lounge, and it's automating everything for the people that want to be automated and that want to leave quickly, but it's also allowing those people that want a personal touch, have the personal feel, to get the warm smile, to get that personal attention. And it would cost McDonald's the same budget, in fact. Why? Because the money that they would save on the people that would normally service the staff coming in, they can then put in to a class of personnel and training for personnel to provide that personal touch. So how do we address the standardization and transformation for small businesses? We already addressed educating, knowledge, information, but it's also the culture. We need to put into the daily life repeatable processes. I've mentioned this multiple times. Understanding how do we do our business. This can be the smallest business up to the largest business. The largest business already started on this. Mapping day-to-day -day processes of every single roles in their organization. If we use the same example of a restaurant, we know exactly what every role should do in that restaurant. By mapping those roles, putting job descriptions, understanding what that person that is fulfilling that role does, that's creating a process. Understanding how they execute that process. Understanding that if something goes wrong, what do you do? If you have a customer that complains, what are the steps that you take to move next to do the conflict resolution, to make sure that you keep your customer satisfaction? At the end of the day, that's what business should be about. Focus on customer satisfaction. People think, oh, we're going to lose the personal touch. If we automate everything, we put robots in the place of humans, we won't be able to even understand how a person is feeling. A few weeks ago, I was talking to my wife and saying on a research study that I had read that by the year 2030, automation will replace most of the teachers for our children. And her response is, but a robot can't tell the individual child's needs. But the fact of the matter is, the technology is already there. There are studies that have been done in Japan that address specifically this. By looking at the heat signatures in the face, the facial expressions, they're able to map to tens of moods, to a hundred moods, to understand, are you confused? Are you sad? Do you need help? Do you feel angry? 
These are algorithms that are already put in place in terms of visual recognition and heat sensing recognition to be able to understand what a person is feeling. Imagine that in a classroom. When a teacher looks at a child now, maybe that teacher has a bad day. And it's normal because we're affected by the environment around us. Does a teacher know exactly what your child is thinking? When your child comes home and asks for help for work, are there days that they feel lost? That they feel that they don't know what the teacher said? There are systems that are already developed that look at the expression and can sense the mood and can adjust to be able to alter the information that is provided. This is why I believe in that research study. And I believe that the statistics provided are going to be much higher than what was projected. Because when you look at this convergence of AI, all of these research studies taking place across the world, and you look at how all of these come to a culmination of providing cognitive systems that can interact with people, that can understand people, that can move like normal people, that can smile like normal people, that can even be sad. These are all things that exist in technology today. We've had flying cars for some time. In recent weeks, we've seen successful tests of flying cars. Uber states that by the year 2020, that they will have flying cars in Dubai. The future is now. We are living in a time of convergence of such catastrophic and great events for technology converging into a point that is beyond what most of the people in this world really do not understand. The legalities of this, if we look at the flying cars, why do not, we don't have these in New York, in Los Angeles, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in London? The big part is the law, the regulation. Because it requires regulators to be able to say, how can these cars operate? Where can they land? How fast can they go? It also addresses an insurance. Who accepts the liability? There are many things to think of when you look at the legal implications in the moral code. Getting back to the moral code, it's the same thing with the robots. Who tells the robots what to do? We've had several governments that look at implementing their own standards and regulations based upon what they believe. I'm currently working with a project with UNESCO that is focused on setting a global standard based upon humanitarian treaties through the UN that addresses not trying to lock this in legal debate for the next 20 years, but based upon what the UN member states already believe and have already agreed to under their treaties, taking this moral code, if you will, for humans and applying it to robotics and artificial intelligence. This is the future. We need to then interact. I support UN and UNESCO for this. Why? Because it is a collection of nations around the world that are coming together. UNESCO stands for UN's Education, Science and Cultural Organization. It's pulling together everything from humanitarian aspects to be able to understand how that convergence is going to be controlled.